we received the drives and uh, we started to screen and it became clear within um, 10 minutes that somehow over the course of the past 60 years, all the footage got completely scrambled up and we were dealing with 140 hours of individual shots. Oh, wow. There was no continuity from one shot to the next. Um, so it's akin to essentially someone emptying out a bunch of letters on the ground and they go, you want to read Watership Down? Go, it's right in there. Just kind of figure it out. And, um, and so this was before we could even start like writing the movie. It was just this terrible jigsaw puzzle. None of the footage had any sound. Um, and there were no notes or logs uh, to detail which chimpanzee was which chimp. Mm. Um, and there were 160 chimpanzees that Hugo photographed, of which there were four or five that were relevant to our, our story. So um, j just the, the ability to, to begin to write this film was a bit of a, 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 a big task. We, as we sat around cataloging the footage, we built a 7.1 mix room at our office to start with sound editing. So we actually started sound editing before picture cutting. Wow. And we had acquired uh, a bunch of audio, probably like 50 years worth of field recordings from Gombe. And, um, and had this one recent USC graduate, it was his first job, and for two years he did nothing wow. but work on chimp vocalization. It's, it's, a, it's remarkable, just, and the sound design in particular, the score by Philip Glass is amazing as well. It's, it's amazing to hear that, that all that went into it and there was nothing yeah. really to work with to start with. That's yeah. fascinating. So talk a little bit about Jane's role in this, in terms of her, the interview and sort of her voiceover and everything else that, that comes to play in telling sure. the story. So, so Jane, um, initially the film was conceived, it wasn't going to have any narration, it was just going to be music and sound design and we've boarded that <laughs> relatively fast, like in a couple of days, um, because there's like no context, it was like yeah. nothing's happening. Um, and uh, and Jane, when she was first approached, I think I said this before the movie, when she was first approached, she was like, I, there's been so many movies with this footage, I don't want to see anything, I don't want really anything to do with it. And she gave us, she only offered us um, a couple hours to interview her, which we took a couple days. Yeah. Um, and that happened after I'd already edited the film. We did the interview oh. after we cut the film. Um, oh. Well, because the, the I, I try to design the shots to reflect what the person's saying. So you can only do that after the fact. Right. And, and so um, so we knew exactly where Jane would come up on camera. She didn't, but we knew where right. she was going to come up on camera. And that allowed Ellen Kiris and Ian Kincaid, our gaffer and I, to set the lighting for the appropriate movie because the movie's supposed to go from, from morning light into mm -hmm. evening and then into a new day at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, um, so yeah, so Jane was, uh, I mean, she loves the film now. She, she, she's, she's really, <laughs> really pleased with it. Um, she didn't think that, she didn't think there was anything left. And then, you know, when she watches it now, she, she, she gets the, the, the immersive, mm -hmm. I mean, what she, her exact words are, it's the first time she's seen Gombe realized uh, as it is in her mind. Um, some of that has to do with, I think, some of the magical realism that isn't literal at all. It's like the color grading and the, um, I don't know if anyone noticed, but the chimpanzees kind of move in sync with the music mm -hmm. and they bark, bark, I don't know if bark's the right word, they bark at, at the same pitch as the music often. Um, there was a concerted effort after Philip Bert gave us his final recordings. We went back and re-edited the entire frame, every single edit of the, sh the film to synchronize with both Philip's music and then to have all the animal movements um, synchronized as well to try to capture this sort of magic mm -hmm. of Gombe as it existed in Jane's wow. uh, eyes. The, the, um, the colors in Gombe are predominantly brown a lot of browns and green and it just it's not when you read Jane's book in the shadow of man you're like this is not what it looks like you know and so um the color paletting and the color grading which was 250 hours of color correct um with a lot of contrast grading most of that was contrast grading uh was all done to again enhance that sort of rainbow-esque sort of view of Gombe someone was just asking about the insects and I was like yeah well part of that was the insects they brought in so much color yeah. There's a, a several other sort of metaphors at play that may work or may not, but uh, um, it was important for us to, to, you know, like all my films, I try to capture the experience through the subject's point of view um, through whatever means are available to us. Right. And, and can we talk a little bit about, so you, you said that at the start, but in some ways you, in many ways you're adapting her book. So talk about sort of the writing of the film and sort of how you, how you, uh, how you were able to do that with the book, with the footage that you have. Yeah, so every movie I do, it starts with the same process, yeah. which is when I get the assignment, I read uh, uh, whatever books there are on the subject. Hopefully, if there's primary sources, in the case of Jane, she's a prolific writer, mm -hmm. so there were dozens, about a dozen books to read. Um, so I have a, a pretty 
deep knowledge of the subject, which you have to have before you can screen. Once we have the footage organized, we then sit down and we screen everything chronologically top to bottom. At that point, I break away from the edit room and I work on a script okay. anywhere from like a couple days to three weeks and then we go back and it's critical we do that because it's not like a wild goose chase, especially a film like this because they're, all the shots were disparate. Right. Every action had to be constructed. So, uh, you know, when, when, when the, the, even like something like, um, one of my favorite moments of the film, and I, I got to give Joe Beshenkovsky an incredible amount of credit for the sequence because it, it, it's to me his masterpiece of this film. But the when Jane gets invited to the chimp garden is my the little as I like to call it when she's like chasing after David Graybeard in the jungle and then she pulls back and all the chimps are like greeting her. If you watch, if you ever see the film again, it literally looks like it's an action sequence in a Disney film that it's following. It's, just traditional screen direction, Ch Ch chimp leaves the frame, Jane enters that same shot, back and forth, back and forth. All those shots were shot over the course of 140 hours. There was never intended to ever be designed to play that way. So that for him to remember exactly those movements across 140 hours is, 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 is almost remarkable. And there's a thing, with, someone said to me, like, are the chimps, where'd you get those tamed chimps? <laughs> because they seem so tame around the cameras. And I, I mean, it's, it's what Jane said at the beginning. It's, you forget watching this, that the, I mean, the, the, they can kill you at a, mo at a moment's notice. So, I mean, just the, the fact this exists, and, and that he, the, the, just the fact that he would capture it on 60 millimeter which was so difficult back then to, to do what he did. It's, it's really is kind of miraculous. Like right. what Hugo achieved on film is almost as amazing as what Jane did in her research. Also, uh, there's no stock footage in this film. Every shot you saw was Hugo von Lawick. Everything wow. in the Serengeti was Hugo. There's not one image in this film that wasn't Hugo other than the obvious stuff that Ellen Kira shot. I could, uh, I could keep going, but I, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience. Uh, just, uh, it's hard to see a little bit, so just, yes, please, right here. In all the footage that you didn't use, whether, was there any footage of intervention with other animals besides the chimps? Intervention. Uh, in terms of interaction, I guess? Interaction with any other animals? Yeah, well, they made, Hugo and Jay made a series of films um, in the 70s uh, for Metro Media, one of which was called Wild Dogs, one was called Baboons of Gombe. So there were, there were these other films, they were like Swiss Family Robinson, they all starred Grub. That's for that footage of Grub like driving around the vehicle. Like there's all these films, they were like literally the first reality family in a way. Um, they're kind of amazing. They're very stagey, you know, some of the B-roll stuff in them, but they're, they were uh, good assets. Uh, right here, you. please. Yes. Yes. Correct. 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 Which, just in case people didn't know, the New York Times review had to point out that we use footage out of order. Right. <laughs> like we broke some rule. Right. right. <laughs> like how crazy is that? That in 2017, that someone at the paper of record thinks that all documentaries are shot in order. In sequence, yeah. <laughs> so that, that when there's a cutaway shot in a movie, that was happening at that same moment in time. It's not just thrown in afterwards by any chance. Right. It's like crazy that we, it's real. No, so, so yes, it's a, it, listen, the movie is a, it starts off as a Robert Flaherty film, right? It's a Flaherty film and then it becomes a Ross McAway film. Right. And then, <laughs> If you know what you know yes, what I mean. Yeah, sure. It, like Hugo shows up and he's holding the little Nagra and everything, and and then um, and then it sort of becomes this uh, maybe a maybe a, like one of my movies in the, yeah. in the in the towards the end of the film. But it, it but it was very like the, the Flaherty thing. I love Flaherty. Like Flaherty is why I make documentary films. So uh, I find it I find it like I, very strange that I mean I think what Hugo the way Hugo set those shots right. Um, were very difficult to cut to find the language at the beginning of the film, and I'll tell you why. This is gonna. Are, are, are some of you people filmmakers? Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming so. Yeah, okay, great. Like, so, so you guys can try to do this mind mind trick with me. So, obviously, there's nobody there. The whole story is she's by herself, and so you. We know this is in your mind. We know constructing the film, and I kept thinking I laid in bed every night for a year 
like it was like someone in my family had died, just tearing my shirt apart going, oh my God, how are we gonna make the turn? They're gonna think we're cheaters. Like the second I turn to Hugo, the whole audience is gonna go, fuck you. Like you lie to us, what was all that stuff? And I was like, but we can't start the movie when Hugo gets there because then you miss the best part of the, the movie. Yeah. And so what had happened was we discovered that we had to find a language that was omniscient. Hmm. And that what that meant was if we used any shots that were shot on a wide angle lens, anything wider than a 25 millimeter, the viewer would become hyper aware of the per that there's someone holding the shot. Hmm. So we only used telephoto shots to construct the first 15 minutes of the film before okay. Hugo arrives. And what that also did was it created a visual proximity for Jane getting closer to the chimps. So even when she gets invited to chimp land the first time and it cuts to a scene of them grooming, all those grooming shots are telephoto lenses. Mm -hmm. So again, you're, we're approximating her closeness to the, an to the animals. And then when Higo arrives, we let loose. And now you get all the perspective stuff and he's shooting wide angles and we're allowing camera movement to come into play and wow. et cetera, et cetera. But it was a very, it seems like a really simple thing, but the language, because also a lot of the stuff in the beginning was very stagey looking, mm. you know, which, uh, you know, it's, I mean, it, 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 it was so difficult to get that stuff of Jane not to look, because it was, right, that's how right, it was right. shot. It sure. was shot to be like, Jane looks left. Right. <laughs> Jane looks right. I mean, it was, so we, we took footage that was shot for a different type of movie exactly. and tried to use it to make this type of movie. Right. Yeah. We have time for one last question. I saw you first in the white. Terrific. Yeah. Um, before we conclude, because I know we're about to conclude, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say Jane is playing nationwide right now. It's playing all over New York City, 10 showings a day at the Sunshine. If you have friends you want to take them to this weekend, send them. Please support documentaries in theaters, whether it's my film or someone else's film. We need the support of people. Uh, some of us, we, we make these for this purpose, for movie theaters. I, 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 don't, I, I think there's something called TV documentary and there's a theatrical documentary. And, and I would not have spent two years on sound for television. So, so I, I, I really think when people can see this in a, in a movie Absolutely. theater. Um, I'm so sorry. So to get to your question, which... <laughs> yes, the voiceover. Okay, very good. So, uh, so originally I wanted this to have no just music and, and ambiance. And so I was uh, just as a guide track, I, I discovered that Jane did these book on tapes. And she did a book on tape for a book she did called Reason for Hope, which is a, her guide to spirituality. And so we just started using it for temp, just temp shit to go in there. And then I started really dig it. And then I was like, then, then I'll tell you what happened, right? So the movie is, is, is Hugo's art, his cinematography. Jane is also an artist. She's a writer. She's, she's an incredibly prolific writer. It's one of her first loves. Beyond that, she's an orator. She travels the world. She's one of the best speakers on the planet. And so when I found this book on tape, to me, that is the most pure form of expression from Jane. That is a part, that is her art, you see? Now, if I asked her and I said, can you describe to me your first day walking into the jungle? Okay, you asked me this, yeah, what was your first time? I mean, you're gonna get a pedestrian answer because we're having conversations. So it was like, well, I remember the first day, it was like, it was sunny out and, and we didn't see any chimps for a while. Um, but then after a while, yeah, okay, right? Instead, now we get the rolling hills the little streams, the birds, the insects. I mean, I would have had her arrested if she talked like that during an interview. I thought she was a looney tune. Um, but it, it's a great tool to have. I did the same thing in the kids' season picture with Bob Evans' book on tape. And with the, if you saw the film Montage of Heck, the Kurt Cobain film, I was doing the same thing, trying to use all of his primary sources to tell the story. So. If, I never tried to make it seem like they're the same voice, but I didn't call attention to it. But we definitely did not try to blend them. It, to me, there was like old, Jane, you know, older Jane, and then this sort of younger narrated stuff. Well, we do have to wrap up, but Brad, I want to thank you so much. Thank you, my for pleasure. allowing us to show this film thank you. as part of our shortlist. Thank, thank you, guys, you. so much. <laughs>